Chapter 1 Data Collection, Section 1.1 Introduction to the Practice of st Statistics. The objectives for Section 1.1 We want to be able to define statistics and statistical thinking, explain the process of statistics, distinguish between qualitative and quantitative variables, distinguish between discrete and continuous variables, and to determine the level of measurement of a variable. Now, Statistics is a process. The first step in that process is collecting data, which is what we'll focus on in this first chapter. Statistics plays a major role in many aspects of our lives. It is used in sports, so for example, to help a, manager decide, a general manager decide which player might be the best fit for a team. It is used in politics to help candidates understand how the public feels about various policies. And statistics is used in medicine to help determine the effectiveness of new drugs. Used appropriately, statistics can enhance our understanding of the world. Used inappropriately, it can lend support to inaccurate beliefs. Understanding statistical methods will provide you with the ability to analyze and critique studies and the opportunity to become an informed consumer of information. Understanding statistical methods will also enable you to distinguish solid analysis from bogus facts. At this point, I'd strongly recommend beginning a list of terms with definitions. So I highly recommend you download the guided notebook to help you organize your notes. You might start to get overwhelmed with all the terminology, so a list of terms to refer to would be very helpful. So what exactly is the study of statistics? Well, it's really a process. I've included a bit of, of a visual here as well. Okay, so you first need to identify the question and then you need to collect the data. And once you collect the data, you need to organize and summarize and then come to a conclusion. So in chapter one, again, first we must identify exactly what it is we're hoping to study. We must also determine what our population is. In chapter one still, next we select a representative sample using appropriate sampling techniques. When we get to chapters two and three, once we have our data collected, we have to summarize it. We'll do this both numerically and visually with charts. And then finally, in chapters nine through 12, we need to analyze it and come to a conclusion. Now, the gaps in the middle, meaning chapters four through eight, are a mix of sections. Chapter 4 really can stand on its own. It's all about analyzing the relationship between two variables. Chapters 5 through 8 involve probability and are intended as preparation for the meat of the course in chapters 9 through 12. Okay, so defining statistics and statistical thinking. Statistics is the science of collecting organizing, summarizing, and analyzing information to draw conclusions or answer questions. In addition, statistics is about providing a measure of confidence in any conclusions. The information referred to in the definition is data. Data are a fact or proposition used to draw a conclusion or make a decision. Data describe characteristics of an individual. A key aspect of data is that they vary. Is everyone in your class the same height? Nope. Does everyone have the same hair color? No. Nope. So among individuals, there is variability. In fact, vary, excuse me, data vary when measured on ourselves as well. Do you sleep the same number of hours every night? Do you consume the same number of calories every day? So one goal of statistics is to describe and understand sources of variability. Okay, now explaining the process of statistics. Now for most studies, it is unreasonable to be able to access of the individuals of the interests in your study. The entire group of individuals to be studied is called the population. An individual is a person or object that is a member of the population being studied, and a sample is a subset of the population that is being studied. So here you can see, here's the population. We take a sample from that population 
And then there is the individual, which is the member of the population or object that is being studied. Now, a couple of key comments about identifying the question are needed here. The first thing we really need to consider is what our population is. Again, the population is the group we are studying. So for example, if I'm interested in studying habits of CMC students, then my population is all CMC students. Since asking every CMC student isn't possible, I would then take a sample, which is a subset of the population. The characteristics of the sample are key. So if we select too few or the individual selected do, don't represent the population, any conclusions we draw will be meaningless. Okay, now there's two different types of statistics. We have descriptive statistics, which consist of organizing and summarizing data. Descriptive statistics describe data through, a numer through numerical summaries, tables, and graphs. A statistic is a numerical summary based on a sample. Inferential statistics uses methods that take results from a sample, extends them to the population, and measures the reliability of the result. A parameter is a numerical summary of a population. So, for example, let's discuss the differences between descriptive statistics versus inferential statistics. Now, for example, the statistics of 63% from above would be a descriptive statistic since it is simply a summary of our sample. If we in turn make a broad generalization and claim that 63% of all CMC students support the initiative, then that is inferential statistics. So here's another example. Is the statement an example of descriptive statistics or inferential statistics? Part A, the percent of students in the survey who would return the money to the owner is 78%. The answer is descriptive. We are 95% confident that between 74 and 82% of all students would return the money, then we would say that that is inferential. Another example, the differences between parameter versus statistic. For example, if we know from CMC data that the average age of all CMC students is 29, that value is considered a parameter. On the other hand, if we take a sample of 100 students and find that 63% support a new initiative at the college, that is a statistic, since it is only a measure of the sample of 100 students, not the entire student population. Another example, is the given measure a statistic or a parameter? The percentage of all students on your campus who own a car is 48.2%. In this case, this is a parameter. Suppose a random sample of 100 students is obtained, and from the sample we find that 46% own a car. Then that is considered a statistic. Okay, the process of statistics. Number one, you want to identify the research objective. A researcher must determine the question or questions he or she wants answered. The questions must be detailed so that it identifies the population that is to be studied. Number two, you're going to collect the data needed to answer the questions posed in number one. Conducting research on an entire population is often difficult and expensive, so we typically look at a sample. This step is vital to the statistical process because if the data are not collected correctly, the conclusions drawn are meaningless. Do not overlook the importance of appropriate data collection. Number three, describe the data. Descriptive statistics allow the researcher to obtain an overview of the data and can help determine the type of statistical methods the researcher should use. And number four, you're going to perform an inference. You apply the appropriate techniques to extend the results obtained from the sample to the population and report a level of reliability of the results. So, an example here. Illustrating the process of statistics, many studies evaluate batterer treatment programs. 
but there are few experiments designed to compare batterer treatment programs to non-therapeutic treatments, such as community service. Researchers designed an experiment in which 376 male criminal court defendants were accused of assaulting their intimate female partners were randomly assigned into either a treatment group or a control group. The subjects in a treatment group entered a 40-hour batterer treatment program, while the subjects in the control group received 40 hours of community service. After six months, the 376 male defendants were interviewed to determine if they had any further battering incidents or not. It was reported that 21% of the males in the control group had further battering incidents, while 10% of the males in the treatment group had further battering incidents. The researchers concluded that the treatment was effective in reducing repeat battering offenses. And there is the source. Okay, so the solution. Step one, identify this, the research objective. To determine whether males accused of battering their intimate female partners that were assigned into a 40-hour batterer treatment program are less likely to batter again compared to those assigned to 40 hours of community service. Step number two, we're going to collect the information needed to answer the question. The researchers randomly divided the subjects into two groups. Group one, participants, participants received the 40-hour batterer program while group two participants received 40 hours of community service. Six months after the program ended, the percentage of males that battered their intimate female partner was determined. Step three, you describe the data. You organize and summarize the information. The demographic characteristics of the subjects in the experimental control group were similar. After the six month treatment, 21% of the males in the control group had any further battering incidents while 10% of the males in the treatment group had any further battering incidents. In step four, you draw conclusions from the data. We extend the results of the 376 males in the study to all males who batter their intimate female partner. That is, males who batter their female partner and participate in a batter treatment program are less likely to batter again. Objective number three. Distinguish between qualitative and quantitative variables. Variables are characteristics of the individuals within the population. The key point here is that variables vary. Consider the variable height. If all individuals had the same height, then obtaining the height of one individual would be sufficient in knowing the heights of all individuals. Of course, this is not the case. As researchers, we wish to identify the factors that influence variability. So the two definitions, the first one is qualitative or categorical variables. This, is allow this allows for classifications of individuals based on some attribute or characteristic. Quantitative variables provide numerical measures of individuals. Arithmetic operations such as addition and subtraction can be performed on the values of a quantitative variable and will provide meaningful results. So basically, if a variable describes a quality of an individual, that means hair color, political party, etc., then it is qualitative. You can't add or subtract hair color or political party. Whereas if a variable is numerical and those numbers have meaning, then it is quantitative. Now, not all numbers have meaning numerically. Think of individuals having a social security number. Okay, you're not gonna add two social security numbers because if you add them together, there's no meaning to that. Likewise, if you look at anybody with a jersey, right, and their name on the back describes the number on their jersey. So if you add one number of a jersey and then add another number on a jersey, it's gonna be meaningless because it's not really gonna give you any information. Now, let's take a look at another example here. Okay, so we're going to distinguish between qualitative and quantitative variables. Determine whether the following variables are qualitative or quantitative. Gender, it's qualitative because it's a classification of an individual based on their characteristic. So that means that you're not going to be able to add or subtract what your gender is. Okay, temperature, temperature is quantitative 
because it is a numerical measure. The number of days during the past week that a college student studied. Well, that is quantitative because you're adding up all the numbers that a college student has been able to add during that week. And then a zip code. A zip code is qualitative because it's an attribute. It's a characteristic of the, dis the, the particular community that you live in in that particular case. You're not going to add two zip codes together because it's not going to really give you anything. It's, it's meaningless. St objective number four, distinguish between discrete and continuous variables. A discrete variable is a quantitative variable that has either a finite number of possible values or a countable number of possible values. The term countable means that the values result from counting, such as 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. A discrete variable cannot take on every possible value between any two possible points or values. Now a continuous variable is a quantitative variable that has an infinite number of possible values that are not countable. A continuous variable may take on every possible value between any two values. So let's just take into consideration if we think about the number line, okay? So if we take a look at the number line on a graph, and let's say that here is our number line, okay? And then we're gonna graph. So here is zero, here is one, there's two, and then there's three. And then we have negative one, and we have negative two, and let's say negative three, okay? And then on this graph, I'm gonna pick certain points. I'm gonna pick zero, I'm gonna pick two, and I'm gonna pick three, okay? now. When it means it's discrete, that means it's countable, okay? Countable meaning that the numbers that I selected 0 plus 1, I mean, excuse me, plus 2 plus 3, we can count them and we add them together, it's going to give us a number. So that means that we can count them. Now, we're going to look at the number line again when we talk about a continuous variable. Okay, so for a continuous variable, Okay, again, we're going to look at the number line, okay, and let's say that we have 0, 1, 2, and then 3 here, okay, and then we have negative 1, we have negative 2, and then we have negative 3. So in this scenario, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the numbers that are between 0 and 3, okay? So that means I'm going to draw this and I'm going to look at this in interval notation because that interval tells me I'm going to look at numbers that are all in between 0 and 3. Well, if you think about it, okay, there's infinite amount of numbers in between 0 and 3 because you have 0 0.1, 0 0.11, 0 0.11111, 1.11. So it's infinite. So you can't count all the numbers that are in between 0, 1, 2, and 3 if it is written in this way. So that's why it's continuous, whereas discrete, you recognize individual numbers that you can count. Okay, now, when we talked about qualitative variables and quantitative variables, you have qualitative variables in its own category, and then quantitative variables have two categories. One is discrete variables, and then we have continuous variables. Now, most variables are pretty clear, but some can be a bit tricky. An example of a tricky one is time. Say, for example, we're looking at how long we've been waiting for a bus. We count the minutes and seconds, but really those time units are only rounded. There are actually milliseconds, nanoseconds, etc., an infinite number of possibilities that are in the middle. So actually, any variable that is time would be considered continuous. Now, let's take a look at examples here, okay? Distinguishing between discrete and continuous variables. Determine whether the quantitative variables are discrete or continuous. The number of heads obtained after flipping a coin five times. Well, that is discrete because you flip it five times and you can count how many times that the actual coin is heads. B, the number of cars that arrive at a McDonald's drive-thru between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. Well, that is discrete because that means you can count how many cars have driven through the drive-thru between 12 and 1.
Part C, the distance a 2011 Toyota Prius can travel in city driving conditions with a full tank of gas. Well, that is continuous because you can't count all the numbers in between there. It is an interval. Okay, next. Now, the list of observations a variable assumes is called data. While gender is a variable, the observations, male or female, are data. So we have qualitative data, which are observations corresponding to a qualitative variable. And we have quantitative data, which are observations corresponding to a quantitative variable. Now, discrete data are observations corresponding to a discrete variable. Continuous data are observations corresponding to a continuous variable. So, for example, a manufacturer of a car is a qualitative variable. Qualitative data would be Ford, Chevrolet, BMW, and so on. Gas mileage is a quantitative, which is a continuous variable. Quantitative data would be 13 miles per gallon, 21 miles per gallon, and so on. So, distinguishing between variables and data. The following table represents a group of individuals a group of selected countries and information regarding these countries as of September 2010. Here we have the column country and there is the country. We have government type, uh, the federal parliamentary uh, democracy, the constitutional monarchy, republic, and so on. We have life expectancy years and we have population in millions. We want to be able to identify the individual's variables in the data. Well, the individuals represented are the countries. The variables are the government type, the life expectancy, and the population. And the data would be listed under the variables. So this is the data underneath the variables. Examples, discrete versus continuous. Take a minute and make note of whether each quantitative variable is discrete or continuous. And when you're ready, check your answer below. IQ, ACT score, height, distance commuting, shoe size. Well, IQ is discrete because IQ scores are always integers, 100, 110, 180, and so on. An ACT score is also discrete because ACT scores are always integers. Height is continuous, so even though your height might be 5'8", it's really 5.68241231 feet. It's impossible to measure a length exactly. Distance commuting, it's continuous. It's similar to the reasoning to height. Shoe size is discrete. This is a tough one. An argument can be made for either choice, but shoe sizes only come in whole numbers or possibly one half sizes. You do not have an 8.24 shoe size. Levels of measurement. Instead of categorizing variables into qualitative or quantitative, we can assign them various levels based on their characteristics. Nominal. A nominal variable is one that simply categorizes or names the variables, i.e. hair color. This is the most general level, level of measurement. Ordinal. An ordinal or variable categorizes, but also has a specific order like course grade A, B, C, or D. This is a little more specific than a nominal variable. Interval, an interval variable is quantitative, so the values have order as numbers. The differences between values have meaning, but a value of zero doesn't mean the objective has no value. The easiest example is temperature. Clearly, 60 degrees Fahrenheit is more than 30 degrees Fahrenheit, but zero degrees Fahrenheit doesn't mean it has no temperature and it couldn't get colder. Ratio. The final and most precise level of measurement is ratio. A ratio variable has all the properties of an interval variable, but the ratio of two values has meaning, and a value of zero means the absence of that quantity. A simple example might be points earned on an exam. A score of 80 is twice the value of a score of 40, and a, zero, a score of zero clearly means a student earned no points on the exam. Note that this is different than a grade of A versus F, which would just be ordinal. So here are some examples. 
Categorize each variable based on its level of measurement as nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Gender, IQ, distance commuting, pain rating 1 through 10. Gender is considered nominal. This is just categorizing each individual. An IQ is considered interval. Larger values do imply a higher IQ, but a zero IQ doesn't have any meaning. That individual would be dead. Also, an individual with an IQ of 120 isn't really twice as smart as an individual with an IQ of 60. Distance commuting. This is a ratio. Unlike IQ, it's possible to have a distance commuting of zero, working at home, and a ratio of two distances ha does have meaning. Pain rating. This is ordinal. While it may seem that this is an interval or even a ratio variable, that's not the case. Clearly 7 is more than 5 and 5 is more than 3. But does that difference of 2 mean the same in both cases? What about the difference between a 10 and an 8? Because those differences aren't consistently. This is not an interval variable.